coming from different countries, this may not apply specifically for you, but um, I think that it also provides kind of a good foundation and background of the kind of issues that uh, although the laws may be different in different countries, um, they still are these similar issues. And as we talked about it last time a little bit, uh, different countries are kind of in a different place uh, with this in terms of the progression on of labor uh, employment laws and uh, protection for employees. And so uh, we'll get to uh, talk about those kind of things just a little bit. But uh, but the laws that we'll talk about today, and we won't get into uh, very, very much in the detail of those. Well, first of all, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an attorney. Um, and uh, second, um, you know, because they don't apply uh, specifically to every, every, everybody. Um, we'll talk about uh, these things in a little bit more like in generalities uh, that that sense. Um, so we'll talk about equal opportunity and the law. Um, so uh, in United States, there are a couple of very, very important laws that have been passed and uh, uh, throughout the history. And of course, probably the most important one is the uh, uh, Title IX um uh, you know of uh the uh, uh 1964 civil rights act um they uh, have been uh, since then at least five um out of equal employment laws so uh, um we are, are going to look at those a little bit um of course uh there's been some post-1990 employment laws because that's really when a lot of these uh, laws started. There's, there was kind of a movement towards uh, labor protection, particularly sexual harassment that came about in the uh, 90s. Uh, things changed a lot uh, because of them. So we'll talk about those a um, those little bit um, as well and particular two different kinds of sexual harassment and, and uh, why that's kind of a big deal. Uh, in today's world, uh, we'll we'll uh, talk about different defenses that uh, companies can use in in event that uh, they have been accused of discriminatory practices, and uh, we'll talk about some discriminatory personal management practices in terms of recruitment, selection, promotion, transfer, layoffs, and and distribution of benefits and all those kinds of things. Um, these are very very important and really really big part of. Uh, um, human resource management to uh, to uh, to understand how uh, to uh, treat everybody equally and not to discriminate. We'll talk about EEOC enforcement process a little bit. Um, interestingly, and this may be uh, maybe a little bit surprising to many of you, but I actually have myself. I have uh, filed uh, four EEOC uh, cases, you know, in my career which is pretty, uh, un, I should say, unusual because, you know, I am a, you know, Caucasian person. And uh, so in the United States for a Caucasian white person to file the EOC claim is rather unusual, but um, I'll talk about those circumstances a little bit more in detail so that you understand what occurred. And um, so we'll talk about diversity efforts and, uh, and, and how, um, you know, companies create diversity management programs. So uh, um, the equal, um, uh, um, equal opportunity laws really uh, came from uh, three different main uh, sources of, of laws. Um, there's, of course, the foundation of everything is the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, uh, which is kind of, when you think about it, um, you know, those of you who are a little bit familiar of, of uh, laws in the United States, um, Constitution, those are the most fundamental and most basic and most important um, sort of framework for all the other laws. So uh, and there are certain uh, number of amendments and uh, those amendments, you know, talk about individual rights, civil rights, those kinds of things. And there's a lot of dispute. I mean, a lot of interpretation and there's a lot of controversy, I guess, um, about you know, what all those mean. And uh, I mean, they, they've been around since the beginning, the founding fathers of the United States. So, uh, um, you know, they are really kind of uh, held in esteem 
you know, as something extremely, extremely, you know, important, um, you know, uh, to, to be constitutionally, you know, um, ethical and, and, and follow the constitutional laws. Um, there's uh, the 13th Amendment that also had, had a lot to do with the um, equal opportunity. And then, of course, uh, the uh, Civil Rights Act. Civil rights, obviously, in, in uh, US, uh, those of you who are familiar, um, really uh, happened back in the 60s when everything started going about. You may remember, um, you know, Malcolm X and uh, um, Martin Luther King Jr. and a uh, lot of other folks like that, Jesse Jackson. Interestingly, uh, I've had an opportunity to actually uh, give a workshop or lecture at uh, Jesse Jackson's uh, um, Rainbow Coalition, uh, his headquarters is called Rainbow Coalition, his organization in uh, uh, Chicago, just a couple of blocks from uh, former President Obama's house. And, uh, you know, I gave a presentation there, I think 2009, and uh, Jesse Jackson popped into a room and he, uh, after the presentation, he invited uh, me to uh, uh, lunch, that they had lunch celebration to celebrate the uh, uh, day when Jesse Jackson was arrested in the riots of Chicago, civil rights riots. So it was uh, kind of an honor, you know, to be to be part of that and to, to, to be uh, able to uh, meet and talk to a legendary Reverend Jesse Jackson. Um, also yesterday, uh, when I was flying back from, from San Francisco, um, I uh, was watching uh, a documentary, um, Smithsonian Channel, um in, in in an airplane and uh, i think that the name of was making of muhammad ali and uh, i don't know if i told you last time in our lecture that i uh, i used to be a boxer so uh, for me muhammad ali is uh, absolutely the greatest sports figure in the world in the history and it's not just me thinking that way i, I that's you know many people would agree that uh that Muhammad Ali is really probably the most famous sport, you know, athlete ever. And uh, I mean, what he did was phenomenal in, uh, during the civil rights, he became an icon and, and he uh, um, really started uh, making a lot of noise about, you know, civil rights. And of course he refused to go to Vietnam and all of those things. And he changed his name from Cassius, Cassius Clay to uh, uh, Muhammad Ali because, uh, of course, uh, um, Cassius Clay was a slave name given, you know, uh, by slave masters, you know, during uh, slavery in the United States. So it really is, uh, you know, the, uh, 1964 and, you know, really a decade or two, well, some can say that it still continues today because we are not there yet. And in a matter of fact, the, the, the conference that I went to in San Francisco was uh, precisely talking about um, the... Uh, the, uh, you know, it was it was called um, um, Strive Together Conference. Um, it was uh, about uh, improving um, economic mobility of for, uh, black and brown children um, in minority groups, Hispanics, black African Americans, um, and other minority groups in the United States who uh, many many times um, live in a greater degree of poverty. Uh, live in uh, lower socioeconomic circumstances where they go to schools that do not have resources um, as well as perhaps, uh, you know, the majority Caucasian population. And uh, so they are disadvantaged and uh, have uh, lower graduation rates from high school, lower uh, enrollment rates in, you know, college, and, and then, of course, lower graduation rates from college. And so this conference was really about what we can do about uh, improving those kinds of uh, circumstances, uh, institutional racism and discrimination uh, in the United States. And there were nonprofit organizations from around the country um, talking and presenting. And, and we had meetings about, you know, how we can all, you know, make positive change. So, uh, you know, just because civil rights movement started in the 60s doesn't mean that everything is perfect right now and, you know, we shouldn't continue the work there still are differences and in, in inequalities um, in, in this society. And, and so, um, 
you know that's really kind of important to uh, to note. So uh, um, the Civil Rights Act, what does it cover? You know, it really was it was a um, it was amended in 1972, by the way, um, and uh, it states that employee cannot discriminate based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And so when I really talk about my uh, experience in uh, in uh, filing uh, for ERC claim, it was really about national origin. And so uh, because organizations, um, according to the Civil Rights Act, cannot um, fail or refuse to hire or discharge an individual or otherwise discriminate against any individual with respect to his or her compensation terms, conditions, privileges, because of the uh, individual's race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And so uh, that's what the law protects. In my particular case, I was, uh, I lived in Hawaii. And so uh, in the state of Hawaii, um, Caucasians are a minority. Um, and uh, the organization where I worked, the um, rest of the people, I think that I was one of the only few white people working in that organization and uh, um, the local people they came to me and say well you are you're not one of us um, you know you you are you know you don't understand the way things work around here you know you are Howley and Howley is uh, kind of a dirty word for a uh, an outsider for a white person that Hawaiians used it's uh, equal to the n-word that is that is used of course you know about black uh, Americans and so uh, it is very disrespectful and so they called me Howley um, and uh, there are certain work situations that happened this was a mental health uh, uh, community mental health agency where I worked um, as a case coordinator supervisor and uh, there were uh, certain actions that were taken against my clients um, that I you know was taking care of um, because of the fact that they didn't want to collaborate with me and so uh, as a result of that, uh, I had no option other than to, you know, protect the rights of my clients who, go, who ended up suffering from the fact that the local people did not want to work with me and cooperate with me to help those clients because I was white. So uh, um, I uh, went through multiple year legal battle. I filed a case with EEOC and I won the case and won a settlement, you know, eventually wasn't a huge settlement, but it was, you know, settlement nevertheless. And then after that, I uh, I went to and worked at, a, at the historically black college, where I was the only white person working in an African-American historically black college. And there was uh, one administrator there uh, who was from Africa, actually. And, and so uh, um, he just uh, could not accept the fact that, you know, I was working there and certain things happened and I had to file an EOC claim against them. And once again, um, I uh, uh, won the settlement. The two other ones had to do with uh, uh, my wife. I, uh, um, we were discriminated against in Chicago a um, couple of times um, when because my wife is black. And so uh, people took actions against me because uh, they found out that my wife was African-American. So uh, in those cases, I filed the complaint, but I uh, did not follow through because I moved from Chicago to Florida and uh, it wasn't worth to pursue because the problem with these EEOC cases is that EEOC itself does not have jurisdiction. So when they investigate, which can take multiple years for them to investigate, they will... Um, if you so go, go win your claim with EOC, what that means is that they will give you a right to sue letter. They basically will say in a letter and say, you know, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission found that there was, you know, uh, truth to this claim, and uh, and uh, therefore the EEOC recommends uh, and supports uh, this uh, person moving forward with the lawsuit. But then you have to turn around and you have to go and find your own attorney and pay your own attorney's fees, you know, to, to, to fight these cases. So, uh, um,
so uh so that's why uh they um uh, i didn't pursue because i just it just wasn't at that time worth you know the effort to move forward and so uh so uh you know these are you know um just sort of my personal experience of eoc and i just wanted to highlight them and point that out to you just so that you can see that uh you do not have to be a member of a minority you do not have to be a uh you know, a uh, person of color, um, as black and brown, as uh, often people refer to. And, you know, I personally do not like to use the term minority. <laughs> um, so I typically, when I'm in conferences and meetings, I talk about black and brown children um, because, you know, you know, we, white people are called white, black people are called black. My wife, who is a black person, uh, does not like to be called African-American because she was born and raised in New Jersey, United States. She's never been in Africa, does not speak any African language. And so therefore she does not identify with any African nationality. And I don't mean that negatively. I mean, you know, she doesn't have anything against Africa. Her point is that she's not African-American because she was not born in Africa. I am Finnish-American because I was born and raised in Finland. And so her point is that she's black American. Um, and so uh, that's the way many people like to be referred to uh, in, in United States. Of course, that's a personal reference preference. And so very often you have to be mindful of the fact that some people prefer one phrase to another. People do not want to be called colored, you know, colored individuals. That's a segregation term uh, before Civil Rights uh, Act and Civil Rights Movement. When here in the southern states, you know, blacks have to use have to use different restrooms than whites, and uh, um, you know, uh, we're not allowed to certain restaurants. Have to, you know, sit in a different you know uh, section of a bus, and uh, and that's of course when Muhammad Ali back in the 60s with the Islamic Nation started really, uh, um, you know, talking about the way blacks were treated, and and uh, and so he was a part of the civil rights movement in that sense. And, uh, and I think that's pretty impressive. There are also a lot of executive orders that are signed into law by various different presidents. Um, and uh, of course, uh, they, uh, you know, for example, uh, Johnson administration issued, you know, uh, several executive orders that were really, really, uh, important in terms of the history of labor employment law because uh, those laws um, they uh, required government contractors with contracts more than 50,050 employees uh, to take you know use affirmative action to ensure employment opportunities so uh, um, they also established what is called uh, office of federal contract compliance program so uh, really as an example of some of these affirmative actions that really provided protections to a certain group of people. And in this particular case, um, provided access of minorities to uh, uh, certain federal government contracts. And, and so, uh, because prior to that, pretty much minority groups were excluded from being able to get my, uh, you know, lucrative government contracts. So that's a kind of an example of executive order. Um, of course, Obama signed a lot of executive orders in and and uh, and so uh, um, the labor employment laws evolve, you know, sort of that way. Uh, the Equal Pay Act is uh, something that is uh, quite important. Um, it uh, became a law in 1963, and it was amended 1972, and uh, states that it's unlawful to discriminate in pay on the basis of sex when uh, job involve equal work require equal and skills, effort, responsibility, and are performed under similar working conditions. So, uh, you know, th this, there have been many, many, many examples of this. Uh, um, there, there was, uh, if you, uh, for example, there's an example of a, a prison card uh, that uh, uh, wanted to be transferred to a maximum security prison and uh, it was a female prison card, and this was a maximum security male prison. And uh, she was denied that transfer because they said, well, you are 
female and therefore uh, you know it's uh, not good for you to work in a in a all male prison and so she filed a lawsuit and said not so fast just because I'm a female doesn't mean that I can do the same prison card job uh, there is nothing that you know job description that says that you have to be a male to 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 uh, you know to do that job um, so uh, you know that uh, she won the case uh, it was uh, important change to precedence of, of a lot of those cases so what that means is that you cannot uh you you really in order to, to say i want to hire a male over a female or female over a male specifically you know you really as an organization really have to think through uh do you really have legal basis of of, of uh, uh, making that requirement and in uh, most of the cases over 90 percent of the situations there is no legal basis to say that you know man could do a job better or woman could do a job better um you know and has to be has to be made you know equally accessible to uh to both so uh so that's really important um so equal work equal skills similar conditions um you know they have to uh, consider all of those is the work equal you know are the skill sets equal and are the conditions same for both sexes and so by sex of course they mean gender uh, age discrimination in employment act 1967 is uh, an other um, important uh, law because uh, people in the workplace are getting older uh, there are lots of people who are sort of refusing to or cannot uh, for economic reasons, cannot retire anymore. And so there are people older and older and older working in a workplace. And so uh, there's organizations who uh, would like to hire younger people who stay in the job longer. And, uh, you know, um, so there's uh, the, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act prohibits uh, organizations from, uh, from uh, discriminating against people uh, of uh, you know, uh, age 40 to 65. Uh, now the question is, what uh, uh, what happens if you are over 65 years old? And so uh, those are the kinds of things that, uh, you know, the, the laws and, and uh, individual cases set precedences that set kind of a nuances of interpretation of the law and obviously, you know, over 67 years old would obviously be protected as well. But initially, it was 40 to 65 years of age because um, they are, uh, at that time, 65 was uh, mandatory retirement age. So there was an assumption that people over 65 do not work anymore. That's why it was age from 40 to 65. But uh, amendments to this law eliminated the 65-year-old age gap. So current interpretation of the law is everybody above 40 is protected by law. So it's interesting to note that if you really look at all of these laws, the only people who don't have any particular type of uh, protection are white men below the age of 40. Um, everybody else in the United States in one way or another, you know, have some uh, protection, uh, legal protection you know, from, from these, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether they are women, whether they are minorities, whether they are older, um, and, and uh, you know, whether they have sexual preference different than, you know, uh, meaning, you know, uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, etc. They all have protections, uh, but white men under 40 don't have protections because the assumption is that there is, they don't need the protections. So uh, Vocational Rehabilitation Act is a bit interesting. Um, it uh, essentially means that uh, for federal contracts um, that are uh, above uh, $2,500, uh, those federal agencies have to uh, follow affirmative action guidelines in, in hiring, meaning that they uh, um, have to be open to hiring handicapped persons, um, you know, as long as uh, reasonable accommodations can be made for that handicapped person to perform the job equally. So uh, um, that's pretty important because without that law, people who are handicapped 
would not have an opportunity to uh, work for federal contractors and as a result of that you know could not get rehabilitated you know after their their uh, you know injury that they had um, and then also of pregnancy discrimination act is similar um, in, uh, since 1978 it became illegal to discriminate against somebody using pregnancy you know in in basis of them getting pregnant or childbirth or, re or related medical conditions i mean you can understand to a certain degree why organizations would you know be hesitant to hire a woman of certain age um you know who is about to or potentially could get pregnant while that logic is understandable it's absolutely unethical and, and un unacceptable um you know none of us would be here if women would not have children so uh it is sometimes stunning to me how how backward society you know is about that in comparison in finland where i was born and raised for example they uh, um, have much more uh, longer maternity leaves so uh, um, women and men you know can have time off from work to take care of children and, uh, and workplaces have to guarantee that the job is there for them after they return so you know united states we still have a a lot to learn from uh, it is rather difficult for women in the united states who don't have you know uh, economic resources to hire you know babysitters and child care and things like that um to to uh really work and, and have multiple children so uh, uh that's that's a stunning to me sometimes and so so there are lots of these federal agency you know guidelines um, and organizations that uh um that provide uh, guidance. Obviously, EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, they are uh, the overall com or agency that handles these equal employment opportunity cases. And uh, there is a sort of a sub uh, state level organization, um, you know, for each. And some states call them a little bit different names, but uh, it's essentially the the state extension of for, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that handles those kind of cases in that state. Um, there's also Civil Service Commission that uh, also offers guidance and, and directions. And of course, Department of Labor, Department of Justice, and then there are federal guidelines called uniform guidelines. And so these are important for uh, any one of you who plans to work in the United States in uh, any kind of human resource management type of a uh, job, these are the places that you want to Google. These are the places that you want to, you know, keep your bookmarks on in your computer and uh, frequently visit these uh, uh, organizations to stay uh, up to date with the uh, regulations and changes to uh, guidelines, etc. because um, you know, they may be, they can be hard to keep up with, uh, because, uh, uh, because there's just so many of them and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to determine, you know, what, what applies to what situation and what the interpretation, you know, of them is, um, us, uh, legal system is difficult because it's all based on case law. So it's per based on these court decisions regarding certain situations. So. There are some early decisions uh, regarding equal employment opportunity, such as uh, Creeks and Duke Power Company case, which is court ruled that the discrimination, you know, first the court ruled that discrimination does not have to be overt to be illegal. So it doesn't have to be like blatant on your face. Um, it can be very subtle. And like I was saying, the conference that I was in last week really, uh, was talking about institutional discrimination that is very subtle. You know, here in the South, where, where I live, I mean, there are still signs of discrimination. I mean, people wave confederate flags, you know, behind their trucks or in the front lawn. And, uh, you know, um, it's not necessary that people, you know, yell in the street to me and myself because I my wife is Black and we have an interracial family. But, you know, we also are not, Going to be invited to certain situations and you know it's very likely that they uh 
these attitudes in a society impact you know our ability to get certain jobs so uh so that's why creeks and duke power company case was important second the court also held that uh, employment practices in that particular case requiring a high school degree must be job related and third the court placed the burden of proof to employer to show that hiring practices is job related so what that means is that if you're going to require a high school degree or college degree you know for somebody to uh, work in that particular position you have to make a case for it you have to in the job description uh, justify why you require that if you are requiring a college degree just to hire a college degree it can be interpreted as a way to try to uh, eliminate uh, minority applicants for the job because uh, it could be assumed that uh, you know that's the motivation behind it and the calculation there is that minority uh, applicants would be less likely to be college graduates and and therefore that's the motivation and so whatever the requirement is it has to be justified somebody's uh, okay there's a raised hand any question yes uh, tommy uh, uh, with respect to uh information is not always like uh, uh, verbal or easy to prove mm -hmm. okay so let's say that i will apply for a position with my like Arabic name, which is Muhammad. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will uh, invitations uh, for uh, uh, interview, and with the same qualification, if I send the same resume with a different name to ten companies, I will get eight out of ten or nine out of ten. Yes. So what, what was your question again? Sorry, I, I'm not sure if I understood your question. So I mean, I mean, you cannot prove it. So let's say I was discriminated based on uh, 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 race or age. You cannot easily prove it. And well, you, that's that's correct. Yes. Yeah, and if you want to file a case, yeah, the, it will be associated with too much expenses and and time. Correct. It will be time consuming money yes. consuming and at the end of the day it's not easy to win you're absolutely correct and that's what uh is very very sad about it and 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 as i was talking about my own examples of uh filing eoc cases that's why the two two later cases um i i just did not pursue because uh, in the first case i represented myself without an attorney it was extremely stressful took a, a significant amount of research for me to do and it did not go to trial so it ended up being settled so it was possible for me to negotiate the settlement myself but I would not advise anybody to to try to do that because it's uh you know if you're not an attorney and I'm not an attorney it was it was way over my head um you're absolutely correct um and that's why you know the Creeks and Duke power company case you know uh established that the burden of proof is on employer employer so if you make an accu accusation you are not the one who has to prove that it occurred uh, they are the ones who have to prove that it did not occur and so while you are absolutely correct that regardless of that president it's still somewhat difficult to uh, prove these cases and you're absolutely right that many people do not move forward with these cases because of their uh, financial costs that could be involved it is also true that there are uh, legal clinics around the country um, and and they are civil rights related equal opportunity related nonprofit organizations that uh, exist for the precise purpose of for uh, uh, helping individuals who don't have financial resources to fight these cases so sometimes people can find an agency that will sponsor and support their case and kind of advocate for them and go for it and that's typically how these things kind of work out but in order for for you to be able to you know get that kind of support your situation has to be rather severe and uh, that agency have to see that as an opportunity to advance law in some kind of way but uh, in any case 
you know, the, uh, if you file that kind of a case, it is the organization, the employer that's going to have to prove that it did not occur rather than you really to prove that it did occur. So the burden of proof is on organization side, meaning that a lot of the cost is also on organization side. And so uh, that's why if you let somebody, you know, if you don't hire somebody and you have no reason at all, well, if you do, if you are not able to give any reason, then the assumption is that any reason will work. And so uh, it is always for human resource uh, professionals, it is always important to uh, make sure that you do have a reason and that you do justify your actions. Because if you get sued and you can not justify it, then the court may rule against you just because you have no explanation. So therefore, the, the, the unethical, illegal explanation, you know, makes sense. And so uh, you are right. It is difficult, these cases, and it depends on uh, which state you are in. Some states are more employee uh, supportive than other states in terms of the, the, the court systems. And so there's a lot of factors to, to be taken into consideration, you know, whether or not you should move forward with your case. But uh, I personally highly encourage people to, to go ahead and try to move forward with their cases because uh, the world doesn't change if people don't fight, you know, and uh, the legal system is there, you know, to, to legally and ethically, you know, fight for your rights. So uh, I think it's important for all black and brown, you know, individuals to, 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 to fight as much as possible. Sorry, uh, just to add more to uh, our discussion, I know some people who are like highly qualified and they were suffering to get a chance or uh, an opportunity. And at the end of the day, what they did, they just changed their name, legally changed their names. Yes. And when they changed the, their names and started like, submitting applications under the new name, they got a job. Yes. So that's to explain how hard is, how deep is like discrimination in North America and how people are suffering to get like equal opportunities. I know some companies are like implementing some measures to make sure this discrimination is not happening. And uh, uh, I'm lucky that my employer, uh, so the company I'm working for right now, they have a very straightforward uh, application process, uh, but this applies only to the uh, uh, entry level jobs. Again, if you want to uh, apply for a higher level job, they first consider uh, uh, internal hires. Yes. And they give the external hires. If they are like highly qualified, they will give, they will give them a chance. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, and uh, you're right; people go absolutely through a little bit extremes. And by the way, it just occurred to me that earlier in my discussion, I referred to Title Seven as Title Nine, and I apologize. I work in higher education, and Title Nine is a, is a different than Title Seven. You know, so uh, obviously, we. One one, you know. I mean, it's a Roman numeral for seven. So uh, uh, just wanted to make that correction. But but you are correct. People uh, people go to extreme, which is which is you know myself. And you know, I mean, I, I'm not a minority, you know, person. So I do not claim to understand the challenges that that some of you who are uh, different, you know, racial background and ethnicity and, and national origin. Um, you know, I'm not trying to compare any more than I try to compare my experience to my wife's experience as a, as a, you know, uh, black woman in, in America. But uh, my name, Tommy, T-O-M-I, it's a Finnish name. And it's also um, happens to be a Japanese name. You know, it's a woman's name in Japan. Well, it can actually be man's name as well. But um, in the United States, names that end with I, like Tommy, usually are perceived to be women's names. So in numerous, numerous places, um, people have mistaken me for a woman, you know, just by seeing my name. And uh, they could they could 
potentially be an uh, impact, you know, in, in, in a lack of uh, getting a job interviews or something like that, because, you know, people don't know if I'm a male or female and they may be preferring male hikers and they may have, uh, you know, and so, uh, so yeah, that's why uh, it uh, is uh, uh, tricky. So, uh, um, yeah, they, uh, they, uh, uh, this is a complicated situation. So you're absolutely right. So I actually started using my middle name, you know, Leonard. Um, and and uh, I hate to, I hate the fact that I have to do that. But that's kind of the point that you're making is that people are forced to make these kinds of things to to, to, to get better job opportunities. And it's not fair. The um, Albert Mill Paper Company and Moody, um, that uh, had to do with the testing involved. You know, there are a lot of uh, selection tests that can be used in uh, intelligence IQ tests, you know, there are a lot of uh, um, aptitude tests, there are lots of different kinds of things like that. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they could be used illegally to eliminate certain uh, racial or ethnic groups. Um, and, uh, and so the law uh, of that case uh, required employers to show that if you are going to be using that kind of a test, and we'll talk about those in selection way more, what kind of test can be used. If you choose to use a test like that, then you know you you have to establish and explain and support why it's uh, it's uh, uh, required for the job. So uh, so yeah, uh, those are examples of many you know cases that president establishes, and that's why if you're not an attorney and you, if you don't study law, it would be difficult to know. And of course, state law, state cases, I mean, there's just so many complications that you could go and you could raise, you know, file a lawsuit, but you would be completely unaware that there was a president that already ruled in certain direction. And so uh, um, you are disadvantaged. Uh, attorney would know. And, uh, and that's why attorneys in the United States make a lot of money um, because everything is based on case law. And so you have to go to school to know how to study case law and to concentrate on that um, in order to, uh, to to really win cases. So um, it's an unfair society. There's no question about it. I mean, um, and it's uh, particularly unfair, um, you know, for people of certain ethnicities, certain races. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, there are those of us, like myself, who are white Caucasian people who are fighting hard to try to make the world a better place for those who don't have that white privilege and, and that same advantage. Now, although I'm a white person, I'm also a first generation immigrant. So uh, every time I open my mouth, people hear my accent. And so they are right away saying, where are you, where are you from? And uh, many, many times, and I'm sure many of you have experienced the same thing, even if you are U.S. citizens and first generation immigrants, people coming to you and saying, well, you're not a real American, which I just laugh when people say that because I just say, well, I wish that that wouldn't be true because if uh, I wouldn't be real American, then I wouldn't pay taxes. And since they are do, do take my taxes, then I guess that means that I'm pretty real. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but it's uh, without without a doubt. Uh, I mean, it's it's not it's not a fair society. And so, uh, um on the you know individual side when you are looking for jobs and everything and 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 you know if you feel like you've been discriminated you know you need to know about these laws and know your protections uh because you know they are significant protections uh on the side of an employer if you are a manager and you work in a you know human resources department you then have to know how to also you know turn around and protect yourself you know against these claims so uh from the HR side, you have to make sure that you have justification for any kind of a, And of course, good HR people don't want to violate these laws. They are all in support of these laws and they they want to be fair. And so they want to, you know, educate the line managers. We talked about that last week. And they want to uh, make sure that everybody in the organization follows this. So that's pretty important. So uh, we are... Uh, it's been almost an hour. So what I would like to do is to, that I would like to give you a 15 minute break 
and then we do another hour well roughly and then you know if needed we'll do another 15 minute break um i'll try to talk a little bit faster maybe to get through this a little bit faster because i kind of thought that we would be able to get through <laughs> a little bit sooner uh, than that but i guess it hasn't been really full hour but um we'll talk about sexual harassment next and then we we'll switch to uh chapter three and see how we'll go there but uh continue to raise your hand if uh, if uh, you need um i intentionally don't want to ask a lot of feedback from you especially in a tricky uh topic like this because there are 26 individuals in a room um it could get very very lengthy if we would have a you know lengthy conversation so if you you know by but but i also i welcome you to raise your your, your hand and and muhammad i appreciate you were saying something earlier and so if you you know have a thought and a comment please share uh, and uh, um, excuse and understand if that that it's it's hard to keep everybody involved when 26 people are in a room um you know invite everybody talk single day so i sort of talk a little bit so ahmed go ahead hi bro how doing uh, so so just i'm asking about the break uh, did you say 50 minutes yeah let's have 15 minutes one five and i have to post okay. uh, and i have to keep a new link to everybody so i will post a new link because this link again this is my individual uh google meet account it only allows one hour and until i get organization uh, yeah. account i have to that's right that's right because, because the session is is obviously going to be interesting yes exactly so i will during the break post a new link into a new announcement and we'll start fresh there is that okay so, okay. Thank you. so 15 minutes from now thank you see you soon and being here in time that's uh you know i've had academia for a very very long time as i told you last time so uh um i've experienced all kinds of situations and you are a pretty extraordinary group of people because uh you know you really are attentive and i appreciate that very much um uh, i know this is difficult you know two hours at a time and uh you know, on a computer screen. So uh, really, really uh, sincerely appreciate it. And uh, I also appreciate the nice comments, you know, after last uh, week uh, presentation. So um, thank you all. I, I really, that means a lot. I, I looked at, uh, you know, we have a lot of information today and uh, in the interest of time, I think that we're going to just uh, uh, leave the uh, chapter three for the next time because it's uh, so important to talk about HR strategy and today it's very very important you know to talk about you know these laws because I mean especially for us we are a very diverse group of people and I think that for us talking about talking about these things it's it's important so uh, um, let's not you know rush and uh, we can uh, go faster with a couple of uh, other chapters um, we only need to do a couple of uh, Saturdays that we cover two chapters to, to be able to cover all of the readings in in here, you know, during this, this 14, 15 weeks that we have together. So, uh, you know, there's no need to need to rush today. So, uh, you know, that also gives you an opportunity to uh, read, uh, you know, the text. I, I hope that you have gotten access to the textbooks, you know, already. And uh, so... Uh, and then so you, that gives you a little bit more time to, to read. I uh, um, will then uh, look at having the first quiz uh, maybe a, a week from now. I have to look into what makes sense, but it'll be a very, very quick, short, no biggie at all. I don't want to make things difficult in at all because, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make this about great. I want to be about learning. So without further ado, let me, uh, uh, open our presentation screen again and uh, glad that everybody made it back um, so uh, okay let's uh, move to uh, other topic sexual harassment um, some of the, the uh, well, you know, not just, you know, um, sexual harassment, but, uh, but you know, uh, there is a, there's a lot that goes into sexual harassment, kind of a foundation. Um, 
Civil Rights Act, of course, um, there was a the Civil Rights Act in the 60s, and then there was the Civil Rights Act of 1991 that sort of added, you know, to this. And so the Civil Rights Act of 1991 really was uh, about, um, I apologize for the noise in the background. My, uh, my family is walking my dogs and the dogs come always back to my office when they uh, when they see me. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they, I, I, I don't know why, because I work from home, so I'm with the dogs all the time. And I, as I told you before, I have two Siberian Huskies and, uh, you know, they always come gather around on my feet, you know, and so it makes me difficult to move my chair. And so, uh, uh, they are back. Um, so um, as I was saying, um, Civil Rights Act 1991 is, is particular about uh, uh, discrimination based on sex, gender, and uh, sexual, you know, harassment. So it's really about, uh, a lot of it's about women's rights. Um, also, American uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, is, uh, um, you know, important, important law that, um, you know, is notable. Um, there are lots of people with disabilities and that's another word that I don't like is disabilities because the truth of the matter is that disabled people are sometimes super abled in some, some other areas in their lives. If you know people who are, you know, just as uh, disabled, you may know that they are very, very, very good employees. They are very, very talented and capable um, in, in many areas if they like. They may not be able to do particular things that are related to a particular handicap, if somebody is in a wheelchair, doesn't mean that they cannot use the computer equally as well as somebody else. I mean, it just goes without saying. So, uh, you know, it's important to remember that disabled people are not categorically disabled in everything. And, and we have to give disabled people opportunities to excel in a workplace. And, and so that's important. And uh, that is over, always an evolving thing. Um, uh, Amendments Act of 2008 is probably the most recent, significant um, during that time. Um, and uh, and uh, um, also there's a lot of movement right now in uh, mental health type of uh, uh, circumstances um, that, uh, you know, those are a little bit more difficult to measure and to, to identify. But uh, mental illnesses are also disabilities, and uh, you know it's it's really how how mentally ill people are being treated and misunderstood. You know, if somebody has depression or anxiety, which are the most common um, type of uh, uh, mental illnesses, uh, twenty five percent of Americans, um, rough estimate, you know, have uh, some type of mood disorder, uh, depression, anxiety, combination, bipolar. Um, and so uh, every every fourth person, you know, quarter of the population, it's pretty stunning. Um, worldwide, uh, the numbers are similar in other parts of the world. So uh, depression is uh, the world's most widespread uh, ailment. So it's something that is time for us to start taking that a little more seriously because it impacts so many different people. So. Uh, you know, um, I have personally, you know, suffered from depression, so I have personal experiences on that. I've also been psychotherapist before I got into uh, uh, academia and management, so I have treated numerous people, uh, numerous people with anxiety and depression, and that's why I feel completely comfortable opening up and being honest about, you know, sometimes where I suffer from those things as well. So uh, um, I, I certainly have empathy uh, for people. Uh, you know, of mental illness. Uh, although I don't necessarily, um, it gets into a weeds over here, but I do not necessarily categorize depression and anxiety as mental illnesses, simply because they are just normal human conditions. Everybody gets anxious sometimes. You know, the, the question really is, when does it get into a point that it disables you from doing something? And when, when do you need treatment and help for it versus, you know, being able to cope with it on your own? So, you know, it's, it's not a simple thing. Uh, there's also Uniformed Services Employment and Deep, uh, Re Reemployment Rights Act. Um, you know, this is important for service people, you know, people who go to U.S. military services. Uh, for them uh, returning to civilian life after military, um, 
it's not always categorically, you know, straightforward that they are going to get a job in a civilian right uh, life. So, uh, so that they, uh, this act helps with that. And then, of course, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, in the last 10 years or so, uh, you know, uh, DNA testing is super available. I mean, we can all, you know, order uh, one of those DNA kits and uh, we can have it, you know, um, studied and, you know, we can, you know, information then becomes available about our uh, genetic uh, background and DNA. And, you know, that information can be very detrimental, you know, because that can be used to, uh, discriminate against somebody. It's always puzzling to me in the United States that if somebody is, you know, half black or quarter black, um, they are considered black. Um, you know, let's take myself an example. My, uh, son, you know, since my wife is black, my sons are obviously uh, interracial. According to the DNA testing that my wife did, she is 70% uh, black and 30% uh, European, meaning that there was some slave master plot somewhere in her ancestors, you know, so she's not technically 100% black or African, you know, or, uh, you know, genetically. And so I am 100% Scandinavian, you know, part Swedish, part Finnish, you know, for my heritage. So if my wife is 70%, you know, or 30% white, and I'm 100% white, then mathematically, my sons are more white than they are black. I know that this is, you know, some may think that, you know, that's a strange kind of way of looking at it. The point that I'm making is that in US society, if you are 1% black, you are considered a black person. So one drop of black, black blood makes you, black, you know, that's something that is an old kind of segregation time kind of a, a way of looking at it. And it has persisted till today's times. And that's, uh, you know, how genetic information can sometimes uh, become detrimental for somebody who presents um, as, uh, you know, certain skin tone because they are very light, complex, uh, you know, black people as well. You know, so uh, somebody can present as a white person, but when, you know, and, and they, you know, may even, even, uh, even uh, identify as such, but then genetic information can be used against them. By the way, the idea of identification is very important as well. Race isn't just about skin color. You know, it's about identification. Um, you know, people with mixed race, they have to choose who they identify with. And, uh, you know, mixed race people, and there are lots of people who are a combination of lots of races. And, and you know, I mean, that's what we find out in the DNA that we all originated from Africa. You know, I mean, historically, like way, way ancestors. So, uh, um it's not just from how somebody looks, it's really more important who, how, how they identify. And this is the same thing applies to gender. Uh, we are now in an era where it's not just a biological gender, uh, it's also an issue of how somebody identifies themselves as. And so, uh, you know, people have a right to determine, you know, certain things and, and identify with certain groups. So uh, with the Civil Rights Act, uh, if companies violate, um, they are, uh, uh, and by the way, the Civil Rights Act ruling really is uh, that uh, in the 1980s, there was limited protection for women and minority groups. And so that's why uh, the amendment, uh, the 1991, came into law in November 1991. And so it uh, kind of rolled back uh, some of the previous laws and placed more responsibility back on employees and really allowed, um, you know, really, really gave, uh, placed the burden of proof back to the employees, employers, because it kind of like from original 19, uh, original one in 1980s, uh, it was determined that, that, it, that it was too much of a burden for the person who was discriminated against had to make the case and that that wasn't fair. Uh, like we just, before the break, we talked about this, but the, the, the 1991, uh, rule said that the responsibility is burden of proof is on an employer to prove that it did not happen and that it also the law now permits money damages um, you know for that and uh, 
And so uh, it really comes uh, down to motive. So, uh, um, and, and uh, the law also in 1991 placed that there could be mixed motives that, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be categorically that race is the only determinant. They could be, they could be, you know, other factors as well, but that employer cannot, you know, turn around, you know, and just, uh, uh, you know, say, well, just because I found one lawful reason to get rid of somebody to, to fire them, uh, it doesn't mean that I also did not want to fire them because I didn't like the race. And so even if there is a mixed motive situation, the employer can still be held accountable for the fact that race played even a minuscule little part on it. Um, I kind of jumped the kind of earlier when I was talking about mental impairment and the ADA, you know, how really a focus, more modern focus of, of, of ADA really is on, on uh, um, mental health and mental impairments and how those can be extremely de dehabilitating or, um, you know, uh, difficult for people um, in uh, demanding workforce that we have today. Um, we have to look at this concept of qualified individual, um, you know, just being disabled doesn't qualify someone for a job. Um, so uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, we have to hire people because they are uh, disabled. We have, you know, organizations don't have to go over their way to hire people who are disabled. Uh, what it means is that we have to not discriminate against people who are qualified individuals. So if your disability does not uh, prevent you for particular, you know, pre uh, performing that particular function, given that you are able to provide reasonable accommodations, then as an employer, you have to treat that person as a qualified individual equally to everybody else. So it's important to note that it kind of tilt the other way. You cannot hire a disabled person over a non-disabled person just because they were disabled um, if the you know, other qualifications are the same. Uh, and the same thing, by the way, with, with any other category, um, you know, race or national origin or any of that, um, you know, it has to be fair for everybody. Reasonable accommodations are obviously something that um, the employer has to determine. What can they reasonably put in place for a disabled person to be able to uh, um, perform their job duties, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, access to wheelchair accessible areas, you know, whatever. Um, I have uh, floaters in my eyes because I had uh, retinal uh, tears in both of my eyes and had uh, uh, vitreal hemorrhage. Uh, meaning, you know, blood in in the, in, the, in the vitreous liquid in the eyeball, um, and caused you know floaters. And so, uh, you know, if I disclose that I have floaters to my employer, they, you know, then have to uh, provide me a larger computer screen or something like that to prefer my my work as an accommodation. And uh, all I need is the doctor's documentation that this is taking place, and the HR has to report to that. Um, so just to use an example of, of for, so it doesn't have to be something major. It could be, you know, um, if somebody has back issues and they've had back surgery or back pains, they may want, uh, you know, uh, ergonomic share. And so typically there's an ADA request that the employer would, uh, within reason, you know, uh, approve and accommodate. So uh, 2008, there were men's amendments. Um, you know, they, they, um, employees, you know, traditionally prevailed in almost 96% of ADA decisions in the Federal Circuit Court. So uh, um, it, it was hard for people to fight these cases. If the employer said, no, I'm not going to provide you the accommodation or no, you know, I can't hi hire you because you're disabled. Uh, employers typically won 96% of those cases. They are ADA Amendments Act of 2008 uh, makes it much easier for employees to show that their disabilities are influencing uh, one of the major life activities, you know, such as reading, thinking, and sleeping. And so, uh, you know, if they have a disability, 
and uh, that means that you have difficult time reading, you have difficult difficult time uh, thinking, and uh, sleeping because sleeping is very important activity. Without sleep, we can't function, um, you know, and you can't perform at work because of that. Uh, you know, those used to be difficult to take into account, but this law made it easier. So, uh, what should managers then do? Because we are here to you know learn how to be managers. Um, do not deny a job to disabled individual if the person is qualified and able to perform that job. Do not do it. If the person is qualified, you have to give them the job if they are the best candidate based on those job functions. And always make reasonable accommodation unless, of course, it would require you to, you know, rebuild your whole, you know, building, you know, workplace and, you know, it would be undue undue you know expense or undue hardship you know for you to provide that accommodation but if it's reasonable for you to do it you absolutely have to make the reasonable accommodation know what you can ask applicants because uh, you cannot make pre-employment inquiries about person's disability uh, in a job interview you cannot say you know ask specific things you know i said are you disabled uh, what is your disability about you can only ask are you able to perform the tasks for, you know, this job? You know, that's all you can ask. You know, are you able to perform the duties that the job requires? And if they say yes, you know, then, you know, they they have to be treated as yes, they can do it. Um, and you have to item, itemize essential jobs functions in a job description. So, I mean, how can you make that determination, you know, whether or not somebody is able to do the, the job well, you have to identify those. They're called job specifications. So uh, essential job functions have to be listed in a job description. Without that, it's hard for you to defend yourself in a, in a court if you don't have those essential job functions there. And, uh, you know, you should not allow misconduct and erratic performance, absences, tardiness, and those types of things, even if that behavior is, you know, linked to the disability. So uh, a person who has dis disability, their bad performance cannot be excused. Uh, you still have to say, look, you know, um, you know, you, this and this and this, you know, performance, you know, uh, is, is suffering. Now, rather than, you know, ignoring it, you say, what can I do in terms of reasonable accommodations to help you to perform this job better and then improve that performance rather than saying, oh, well, you know, you have this disability, so you are late because it takes you longer to, you know, take, you know, uh, get to the building because you are in a wheelchair or or you can't concentrate, you know, you can be, you know, tardy or whatever. So, um, so yeah, it's important not to just ignore, you know, you have to, you know, provide the accommodation, give the person opportunity to perform the job functions and go from there. We already talked about Uniform Services Employment Act, uh, reinstate employees returning from military leave. Um, so yeah, you know, if, if uh, you know, certain, certain, um, certain military, um, you know, uh, for example, if somebody, um, uh, joins military reserves, army reserves, air force reserves, um, they are some military leave, military situations that require them to take some time off. And, uh, so, uh, uh, employers are required to reinstate and, and, maintain keep those people their job back when they return gina is the genetic information non-discrimination act we talked about that uh, prohibits the use of genetic information employment uh, strict confidential requirements so that you know um those, that information cannot be disclosed it's very very important by the way because as we go more into these things that science makes genetic um kind of a detection and, and kind of testing easier um, these become issues that we maybe did not think about in the past as being issues but now they are increasingly becoming so um, they are i mentioned this earlier that uh, they are different state and local equal employment opportunity agencies um, they follow the guidance of the federal equal employment opportunity commission um, but they uh usually cover employees that are not covered by federal legislation. So they are specific state and local EEO laws, like California, for example, have much more 
sophisticated in my opinion i guess it depends you know what how people would categorize that but you know there's more protection for employees in california for example than there is here in alabama alabama is rather conservative a little bit backwards in the sense that you know this is a state and the southern state tend to be you know that way where uh, employers have more power over employees versus in california or new york uh, where uh, relatively speaking there are state laws that may supersede may be actually more stringent stricter and, and more uh, specific than the federal laws um, religious and other types of discrimination this is an important thing uh, as well because um, we have people of different kind of faith uh, increasingly that they, they are the fastest declining percentage of for people with particular religion are Christians in the United States. Uh, the other groups are in increase, the Christians are in decrease, in, uh, you know, and, uh, and so we are uh, back in the day in the 50s, it was assumed that everybody's categorically Christian, although they obviously were not, but there was sort of that kind of societal kind of almost expectation. Um, we're not in the 50s anymore. And so we absolutely have to understand that there are people you know, who are Muslims, there are people who are Jewish, people who are atheist, by the way, that's, uh, you know, uh, a legit uh, religious stance as well, as well, that has to be respected in an equal kind of a way. Uh, they are Buddhists, they are Hindus, and uh, all different categories of religions, the Taoist, and, and uh, religions that many of us are not very familiar with. And uh, all of those people, regardless of the religion, by law, have to have the same protection. So all traditional religions and sincerely held religious beliefs have to be respected and employers have to provide some reasonable accommodations if people require them uh, to, to, uh, to practice their religion. You know, time off and, uh, you know, if you have to do a prayer, you know, several times a day or whatever, you know, you have to uh, provide an opportunity to do so. Same-sex mar marriages, um, you know, it's a very much of a trend in discrimination law right now. Uh, a definition of spouse. Um, um, it's uh, when I came from Cal uh, California, from San Francisco, uh, flew back Thursday evening. I uh, flew back and sat next to a woman uh, for uh, the flight for several hours. And I had one of the best discussions that I've had in an airplane uh, for maybe ever or a, at least very, very long time. Uh, with this particular woman and uh, you know she is married to another woman lives in San Francisco and uh, she was coming to Mobile Alabama to visit her mother and uh, you know we we're just talking about a lot of these things so um, we have to start uh, you know addressing this issue and uh, of course there are state specific laws and uh, and everything but uh, according to federal law same-sex marriages are recognized and so under that um, you know, we should we should start learning to recognize that as well. Um, there's affirmative action for college admissions, particularly in Michigan. Uh, that is an important thing to note. Um, so what happened in Michigan? This was uh, kind of an interesting uh, interesting kind of a thing that that um, for uh, I can't remember right now exactly. Uh, but there's a there's a basically U.S. Supreme Court upheld the Michigan constitutional amendment that banned affirmative action in admissions to the state's public universities. So what happened was that uh, they were giving sort of like extra points to uh, uh, people, black people, to get into universities. So they were using affirmative action and saying we'll need to, you know, certain percentage of people have to be uh, um, accepted to universities, state universities, and they used uh, race um, and categorized, they had quotas for, uh, we have to you know, accept this many black people, this many Asian people, this many white people. And, uh, and uh, so uh, it is interesting that it's actually the black people who were saying, you know, you can't treat us that way. Because what happens is that if we get accepted to university, just because we are black and you had an affirmative action quota, then we are going to be treated by our fellow 
students as being, you know, not deserving, not earning the admission on the merits of our, you know, intelligence and academic achievement that people treat us and professors treat us um, as we are just, you know, affirmative action cases and we are just there because of our race. So interestingly, that was the state uh, they, they, they stands. And so they turn around and were able to, you know, uh, change that practice in the state of Michigan. Um, retaliation is interesting. Um, I mean, so uh, um, this is something that is being, uh, you know, looked at uh, a lot because uh, who do you make a claim against? Um, who is defined as your supervisor? Um, you know, and so uh, uh, sometimes uh, in organizations these days, we have self-managing teams, we have matrix organizations where there are multiple people who may in any given time have some sort of supervisory, you know, responsibilities over you. And so, uh, you know, if you sue somebody, who is then the actual supervisor? And so that's something that is kind of a trend right now to be thinking about. Um, now, sexual harassment, very important in today's uh, environment in a workplace. Um, and uh, it is happening uh, much too much. And there's increasing amount of cases uh, come about. Um, there's been, you know, in news very frequently, um, cases of, you know, uh, well-known um, politicians or corporate leaders or um, something, you know, actors, celebrities who get accused of uh, rape or uh, sexual harassment. And uh, it turns out that these things have been happening a lot uh, in historically, but women did not, uh, because society wasn't tolerant or believing them, the women did not speak openly about them. And now there is kind of the Me Too movement where more and more women have come and said, yes, this has happened to, to, to me. And, uh, and, and women have uh, made a stand. So, uh, um, of course, you know, it started in 1994 with the Federal Violence Against Women Act. Um, but now every workplace is uh, required to uh, uh, train people on, uh, you know, how not to sexually harass. Quid pro quo is, uh, uh, is, is uh, the kind of sexual harassment where, uh, you know, you do this for me and I'll do that for you. It's a specific direct request and say, if you sleep with me, I will give you a promotion type of a situation. Uh, if you go out on a date with me, I will give you this and this and this as your supervisor. That is uh, the most blatant, most obvious type of a sexual harassment scenario. But it doesn't have to be that blatant to be sexual harassment. It can also be what is called hostile work environment. If other people are cracking sexually inappropriate jokes or posting inappropriate posters or things like that in a job workplace, and if a woman, and by the way, it doesn't have to be a woman, men can be sexually harassed as well. Uh, but if uh, somebody feels that that is inappropriate, um, then uh, you know that can be sexual harassment as well. Um, it can be by supervisors, um, but it can also be by co-workers or customers or non-employees. Um, you know, if uh, a waitress is on a restaurant, you know, doing their job and uh, they get sexually harassed by a customer, the workplace cannot ignore it. They have to take action. They have to remove that customer from the premises. They have to support and defend uh, uh, the em employer uh, employee who was treated that way. And uh, so if they don't, the employee could sue the employer for not providing safe work environment. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it can be, you know, anybody. In terms of what is the environment, uh, when is it hostile? Um, there's some, uh, obviously, uh, presidencies and some, some, uh, cases that that uh you know um we could talk about a long long time uh you know there is a uh, uh meritor savings bank uh, versus vinson um there is uh, uh burlington industries versus alert 
there's Farringer city of Boca Raton. Uh, so there are lots of these uh, uh, cases that constantly are evolving uh, to, uh, you know, rule when something is uh, considered uh, hostile and when not. Um, the bottom line of this is that when you kind of think about these things, you have to remember that a law isn't enough. Um, just because, you know, something hasn't been ruled by law in a specific, special situation, um, you should always take it seriously. You know, don't expect that you have a legal protection as an employer if somebody makes a, you know, sexual harassment claim. Take it seriously. Um, you know, make sure it is at first um, because uh, women or anybody who is, you know, subject to sexual harassment, you know, we have to believe them. We have to take it seriously somehow. And that's the bottom line of that. Um, so because, you know, the courts are going to turn around and, and look at how you um, responded to it. So what can employee do if this happens to you? Well, you complain. First, you are, um, you have to report it. This is very, very important. If you are sexually harassed as an employee, you have to make it know. You tell to the you know, person who, who uh, uh, harasses you and stating that this is unwanted. And, uh, you know, preferably put it in writing, preferably, you know, do it so that, you know, you can prove that you told that harasser that you do not appreciate you know what they are doing and then you have to inform your own supervisor and if it does not uh, cease or stop from that you need to file a verbal or written report um, and and uh, it has to be investigated and uh, if the organization doesn't follow through and do something about it ultimately you know you go to eoc the other kind of a uh, trend you know in today's kind of world is uh, uh, bullying uh, there's lots of bullying happening in a workplace. It also doesn't have to be blatant. Uh, there are many, many different forms of bullying and intimidation. And, uh, um, you know, that has to be uh, uh, considered. And, and many times it happens uh, in social media and it's digital. And so uh, that becomes very tricky to what degree employers can uh, monitor those things. We talked about that last week a little bit. Um, there's no, you know, straight answers because it's case by case basis. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the point is that those has to be investigated and, and, and looked into. Let's, let's talk about, uh, defenses that organizations can make if they are discriminatory practice allegations, um, and those types of things. Um, there's a difference between, uh, disparate treatment and disparate impact. And uh, that's kind of important to, to note. So disparate treatment uh, means uh, intentional discrimination. Uh, it exists where employee treats an in individual differently because that individual is a member of a particular race, religion, gender, or ethnic group. Uh, for example, if the organization says categorically, we don't hire drivers over 60 years of age. Well, that would be blatant disparate treatment. Disparate impact is a little more subtle. It means that an employee engages in an employment practice or policy that has a greater adverse impact kind of effect on the members of a protected group under Title VII than uh, on other employees, regardless of intent. So the rule says that employees must have college degrees to do this particular job. Remember, we talked about that a little while ago before the break. You know, you can't just say you gotta have a, you know, you gotta have a college degree just because, you know, you have to have a reasonable reason why. Because otherwise, you know, more white males have uh, college degrees than some minorities. And so obviously by making that rule or requirement, you are actually discriminating people, although you're not, you know, being, you know, it's not, you know, blatant, but there is a subtle way of, you know, ruling certain people out. Uh, Coca-Cola Corporation back in the 70s, uh, you know, there was a group of uh, uh, 
black employees who uh, uh, sued the company for uh, it wasn't so much that the Coca-Cola wasn't hiring black employees. It was that they did not get equally uh, promoted and didn't get the same opportunities in the organization once they were hired and they were able to prove uh, that that was, uh, you know, company company wide. And so Coca-Cola lost that lawsuit. And since then, of course, they improved significantly. Uh, and so sometimes it takes a lawsuit. So. Uh, how do you show adverse impact? Um, you know, it's complicated. Um, so there's sort of certain rejection rates that, uh, you know, uh, four-fifths rule uh, rejection rate, for example, that is used, um, standard deviation rule, uh, they are, uh, we don't have to get into those right now. They are a little more complicated. You can read about them in a book, but... Uh, but there are ways that we uh, calculate and, uh, and uh, uh, determine if uh, there is uh, adverse impact. The McDonnell Douglas test articulates four rules that kind of must be shown by a potential employee. One, person belongs to a protected class. Two, an applicant was qualified for an open position with the employer. Three, despite being qualified, the applicant was rejected. And then four, after rejection, the position remained open and the employee continued seeking application, applicants with the complainant's qualifications. So uh, those are kind of uh, parameters that can be used to uh, determine if there's an adverse impact. There's also this thing called bona fide uh, occupational qualification, you know, age, religion, gender, national origin, um, you know, employer says you have to be certain age, you have to be certain religion, you have to be certain way. Um, universities who are religiously affiliated, for example, they do require people who work there to be, you know, following that religion. Um, and because they're religiously affiliated nonprofit organization, they get legal protection of doing so. So uh, that's uh, like, I'm not Catholic. So it would be difficult for me to be a provost or a president of a Catholic university even though I would be uh, otherwise qualified because they get to as a religiously affiliated organization say that close affiliation with religious faith is required. Uh, I don't agree with that, but that's the way it is. Now, gender, there are some positions and some jobs where, you know, um, there are reasons why, you know, I mean, military doesn't allow women in a battle, uh, uh, you know, roles yet uh, in the United States, for example. So, uh, you know, obviously there are some. The famous case about that was Hooters. You know, um, we all, you know, everybody who's eaten at Hooters knows what Hooters is all about. You know, attractive women in uh, tight shirts. And, uh, you know, and that's the name Hooters, obviously it refers to that. Uh, well, there were a bunch of men who sued Hooters and saying, we should be given equal opportunity to also be, uh, you know, be able to be waiters in Hooters. And Hooters actually won the lawsuit. They actually were able to demonstrate that for their brand, for their specific, you know, image and what they are all about, they want the waitresses to be women. And that if they would be forced to hire men, you know, what they represent and what they are all about would not be the same thing. Surprisingly, you know, the courts, the courts, uh, you know, agreed with them. Uh, national region, same thing. I mean, you can say, you know, say, well, you have to be a certain national region. I don't think there's really any kind of quality. You know, I, I can, you know, in my mind, think of any any justification for any situation where national region could be used as a point of feed occupational qualification. Perhaps there is. I just can't justify in my mind any of it. But uh, it is the business necessity, which is, you know, uh, defense created by the courts. If if there's an overriding business purpose for discriminatory practice, therefore, that practice could be acceptable. Like with Hooters, it's a business necessity for them to attract customers because that is what their brand is. Now, if you don't like it, don't go to that restaurant and don't support that practice. But, uh, but this is, you know, uh, what it's called. It's called business necessity and they get to practice that. 
so what can you do as an employer employer and if you are in a, in a hr department well you uh you know know what you can and cannot do uh train your supervisors your managers your line managers on how to properly interview um, candidates how to properly perform performance reviews uh appraisals you know without using any of these protected categories um and uh, and so train people and most importantly talk about it openly you know they could be women in a workplace who feel like they are not treated equally and uh, they could even you know have feeling that there's sexual harassment you know but how would you know if you don't ask people talk to people you know of uh, people of diversity people of minorities people of different ethnic groups racial groups religious groups and ask them and so that's what organizations would constantly be doing to educate themselves you know about these things now we have you know a few more minutes over here so let's talk a little bit about you know the eeoc enforcement process um this is very difficult for you to kind of see their um flow chart out there uh, so look at that in your uh, book and all, but you can also go to eeoc.com um and uh, and uh, they'll they'll tell you the steps um you know uh, applicant false you know complaint false charge eeoc advises employer of the charts uh, and tells them that the mediation is option and uh, then it goes to mediation and uh, if uh, the mediation is uh, successful it ends there if the mediation is not successful then the EOC ask an employee to submit statement of position so they get to say they'll taste it out of the story um EOC may ask some files and documentation uh EOC may even do a, a site visit you know at that part of the investigation then uh, EOC completes the investigation if they find a reasonable cause they issue uh dismissal and notice of rights so you know that's generally known as a right to sue letter and uh, and so uh then charging party may file a lawsuit in federal court within 90 days of getting that letter that's the way it works and that's of course we talked about the fact that there's cost involved and that's why a lot of people don't pursue this um you know i mean that's if they you know i mean if eoc you know the you know if they find reasonable cause they issue a letter of determination and they they usually recommend and offer parties conciliation and uh, you know if the employer at that point says you know okay i uh, i agree i'm willing to consolidate i'm willing to agree i'm willing to work this out then it ends there but if the employer does not follow uh, the recommendation of the eeoc at that point then uh, again uh, uh, the uh, employer i mean the, the employee can file a, file a lawsuit in federal court and uh, after that conciliation attempt they actually have 150 days and also have a little bit more time so uh, anyway that's the process uh, it's it's at the uh, website if you want to look at so file shots shots accepted serve notice investigation course no course and uh, and like i said earlier uh, even if eoc finds no course you can still go ahead and and uh, pursue a lawsuit so eoc does not tell you you know uh you can't pursue it what they are saying is that in their investigation they may not maybe didn't find reasonable uh amount to say there was course uh and so that's of course going to make it more difficult for a uh, employee to proceed but um uh, if they do find course then you know you have longer time period to sue and and uh, conciliation is going to be uh is going to be uh, offered by eoc voluntary mediation of course means that you know it's an informal process in which eoc tries to you know, bring people together to agree on things sometimes there's mandatory disc uh, uh, dispute resolution that uh we agree in uh, as part of uh, uh, 
employment uh, agreement that you know this is that we agree that we are willing to uh, go through mandatory arbitration before we file lawsuits against our organization so uh we only have a few minutes left uh, over here so uh um, they are again eeoc um they examine lots of different things they uh they look into stereotyping they look into uh discrimination they look into tokenism ethnocentrism these are uh, all all different types of uh things that that uh, you know are looked at um Samia um, said, I have noticed in many organizations, diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, training has been very helpful in bringing the team's focus to our teamwork and working collaboratively. That's very, very well said. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, DEI training is really important because in those training, these are the kinds of things that are being talked about. And, uh, you know, we all stereotype. Stereotyping is normal behavior. Um, it's just we should not allow those stereotypes to influence our judgment and decisions about people um you know and uh, discrimination obviously is not normal behavior and so uh, those are the kinds of uh, things that you know we should absolutely uh, absolutely uh, be mindful of um So tokenism, if you don't know what that means, it means when company appoints a small group of women or minorities to high profile positions rather than more aggressively seeking full representation for that group. It means that uh, one person or one group of people are used as tokens to demonstrate to the rest of the world and see we are not discriminating against women. Look at we did this in this and this position, but there may be thousands of other you know, uh, positions where women were not hired, but they just hire somebody as a token. You know, so that's what tokenism means. And of course, ethnocentrism means, you know, people thinking that their way is the better way. You know, their national origin, their nationality, their culture is a better than somebody else, which of course is not. Uh, final thing that I wanted to say is that diversity can drive higher profits. Diversity is good. It's not something that companies should just do because it's legally the right thing to do or ethically the right thing to do. They should do it because it is good for business. You know, when you have more diverse people working for you, you can address the needs of more diverse population. And so that's the way this works. And so uh, absolutely beneficial for organization to, uh, you know, attract diversity, manage diversity. There are many, many benefits. But of course, when you are bringing different people together, there is a potential for uh, conflicts. You know, it's not like you're inviting conflict, but of course, um, you know, you, you, you're creating, you know, uh, situations where you bring people, with different, you know, viewpoints and personalities, cultures, all of this kind of thing together. And so that has to be managed. So uh, diversity is very, very good when it's properly managed. And so, you know, um, these top down diversity management programs, and they have to be demonstrated by the top that uh uh you uh take this thing seriously so uh you have to provide strong leadership always assess the situation provide training um and uh, change cultural managed systems and evaluate these programs and by the way judelin earlier to say is uh, stereotype judging um yes and no so uh if uh, um, if you walk in a dark alley and there is a person who a approaches you with the knife in their hand, you in instantly are going to stereotype in your mind and saying, OK, that person has a knife in their hand. They are walking towards me. Uh, they may be dangerous, so I better run. Um, so uh, is it judging? Yeah, you're making a judgment uh, based on a category of how somebody presents themselves. And in certain situations, it's completely normal and it can be helpful in surviving in situations. You go hiking in a forest and something that looks like a bear is coming to you. You stereotype the bear as being dangerous and you run um, versus uh, versus uh, stereotype when you're saying, you know, somebody this and this, you know, somebody's skin color, I stereotype them as being lazy and therefore, you know, they are not good employees. 
well, skin color doesn't make anybody lazy, right? So it's it's right or wrong. It's not, you know. So uh, affirmative action, of course, is taking actions uh, to eliminate the current effects of past discrimination. It's uh, it's uh, controversial because there's some quotas and 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 uh, you know uh, as we talked about the Michigan admissions example that sometimes affirmative action can be used in a way that you know uh, doesn't satisfy people. So, uh, uh, but legally, organizations have to have affirmative action programs, and you know here are some of the some of the steps. But we are uh, we only have five minutes left over here. Um, so I just kind of wanted to ask if you uh, uh, if you have any questions at this point. Um, you know the you know we don't really have too much information. We could go into more into these steps of administrative action program, but you can read them from the slides. They are it's kind of self-explanatory. Reverse discrimination is an interesting kind of a uh, concept. Um, it means that you know you're you're discriminating against non-minority applicants and employees. So if you go overboard in hiring black people just to prove that you're following affirmative action or something like that, well then you actually may be going overboard and you may actually be discriminating against white people. And so you gotta be careful of that as well. So that's really, you know, that's really, you know, all that I have to say today. Um, you know, rest of it sort of review uh, over here. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, any, any final comments or thoughts? Uh, Tami, I have a question here as I'm re reviewing the model, the assignment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can we use uh, Google documents even it's not uh, MS Word? Um, yeah, as long as I can open it, uh, you know, um, that's and really, I mean, so if somebody uses, uh, you Google know, Doc and we will convert it to PDF and we'll submit it to you. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess you can do that PDF. You convert it in a PDF. You can, I can read it in a PDF format. That's fine. Yes, you know, because so. uh, like the Microsoft is not working good to me. I don't know what happened for the university. And so if we can use other forms, then we can, we can yeah. use the company's uh, yeah. account like that. Yeah, that's fine. PDF is fine. Um, and and uh, uh, just make sure that, I mean, you know, in, no matter what format you use, make sure that you don't, you know, copy and paste any information from your sources. And uh, so uh, part of the reason why we use certain kind of file, um, you know, uh, types is because we are able to run them through Turnitin, which is a originality detection software that we are able to, you know, see if somebody is plagiarizing or not. Um, and, you know, so make sure you use your own words and cite your references, you know, properly. Um, but yes, PDF is acceptable. Also, uh, you know, if you're a Macintosh user, uh, you know, Mac gives, uh, you know, free pages, I guess it's called. Um, and, you know, I'm a Mac user. Uh, it's just that I have MS Word, Microsoft Office loaded on my Macintosh in my MacBook. So, uh, but if you uh, do use pages, I'm able to open it. So really, it's just a matter of you know being able to be able to be able to read your document. Okay. So uh, it's very far. It's on December, but we want to read in advance because December have lots of holidays. Yes. So thank you very much for. Yeah. Well, thank you, and thank you for understanding on that. But that was a good question. I appreciate that. Okay. Any other questions? We have a couple of minutes left before uh, you know this. Uh, uh, session is, uh, you know, closing me out. If you don't have any questions, um, you know where to find me, you know how to reach me. Um, if uh, um, the uh, organization took care of the recording like uh, I was told, uh, I can tell it from my end, uh, then the recording will be made available. Um, and so uh, let's hope that that happens. Um, again, well, I'll see you next week, same place, same time. Uh, we are going to go over uh, chapter three. So read uh, if you can. Ahmed, you had a question. Uh, yes, Prof. Uh, it is not a, a question, but I could say it like a, a question.
concern. Uh, it would be very, very helpful, uh, Prof, if you uh, share with us uh, the HR materials and suggested uh, books and each, et cetera. By materials, you mean, uh, I mean, have you received the reading materials, the book so far? Because that, that uh, would not be... yet, not yet, yet. Okay, well, I'm going to follow up on that because I was told by the administrators of Windsor University that they would provide the readings to you. And, uh, and so uh, I asked them and saying, would they want me to provide you? The, because I have the uh, PDF file of the book. Um, and uh, you know, they said, no, they, they'll go ahead and uh, provide it to you. So if they haven't done that, um, I don't mind sending it. But uh, it's copyright law. So, you know, typically uh, the organizations should take care of that. So, Samia. Yeah, Professor, I just want to intervene. I think we have that PDF copy in the portal. Mm -hmm. So if we go on portal, it is there uh, and it's like easily downloadable. Um, yes. Usually we were using other tools to be able to fetch those uh, copies from there. But this is yeah. really a PDF version and easily anybody can download. Correct. It's not, I mean, PDF has pros and cons. The nice thing about PDF is that you own it forever. Uh, you know, if you, if you uh, have a... a you know, ebook through one of these kind of ebook readers. Um, it has some functionalities that are better than PDF, but it's not as portable. You have to use a program to read it. PDF can be emailed and whatever. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and other materials, I post these presentation slides kind of one at a time because I don't want you to go far ahead. You know, it's better to stay on topic for that week. 